What a blessed day in the Lord. Amen. Good morning, Fairhaven. I welcome everyone that is here in the sanctuary and those of you who are worshiping at home virtually. We are so glad that you're here to worship another Sunday with the Lord. With joy and thanksgiving, let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. Join me in our silent reflection. Loving one, I let go of my distractions, my many things, and I sit at your feet only to be with you and to listen. Jesus, walk with us. Church. Please stand as you are able as you are able to, for the call to worship. Rejoice, favored ones, the Lord is with you. We are the servants of the Lord. Happy are you who believe the Lord's promises. With all our hearts, we glorify the Lord. In our very depths, we rejoice in God our Savior. From now on, everyone will call us highly favored. The mighty one has done great things for us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord God, as we search our hearts through this season of Lent, we confess that we have sinned. We have turned away from those in need. We have not lifted up the lowly. We have strayed from your will. We have failed to do the things you have called us to do. We have looked on others with judgment rather than compassion. Forgive us, we pray. Lift us out of our sin and fill our hearts with your goodness and love. See us as we are. 
show us mercy and remember us today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Hear the good news. The son of man came to seek and save the lost. And there is joy in heaven when even one sinner repents. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to, through 42. Jesus visits Martha and Mary. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and, was, and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you please be seated? And I do. Jesus, you make us free to live each day. And so, gracious God, by the power of your Spirit, be among us. Speak to our hearts about the things of Jesus, 
about your love and about your grace. And use me, O oh God, to be your instrument this day so that others might know of your message and your will for each one of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So where would Christianity be without the ministry of women? The women, according to Luke's gospel, bankrolled Jesus' ministry. The women stayed with Jesus through his trial and crucifixion when most of the male disciples were nowhere to be found. The women were the first ones to discover the empty tomb and to share the good news that he had risen. Women leaders were prominent in the early church, witness uh, Priscilla and Aquila, named by Paul, for example. Despite restrictions against women's leadership over the years, women, uh, and it continues in some denominations and some cultures today, the outreach ministries, the health ministries, the hospitality ministries, the children's ministries have thrived in most churches due to the leadership of women. Can we get an amen? amen. <laughs> I'm surprised. I had to ask for it. Uh, anyway, uh, in Luke's gospel, more than in any of the others, Luke makes it very clear that Jesus valued and honored women. Despite the traditions and the norms of first century Palestine, the gospel stories are really well balanced between men and women. Most of the women in Luke's gospel are actually named when throughout the scriptures most women don't have a name. Several women were part of the crowds who followed Jesus. And Martha and Mary, whose house Jesus visited, were some of his best friends and were probably part of that group of financial providers. Today's lesson, in today's lesson, Martha and Mary offer hospitality to Jesus and the disciples. So as I was saying to the children, Imagine 13 people showing up at your house. There were animals to be slaughtered to make dinner. There was bread to be baked. The vegetables needed to be cleaned. The table needed to be set. Everything needed to be cooked. You had to pour the drinks. There's probably a bunch of other things too. And Martha was left doing it all. She gets a little miffed that Mary is just sitting and talking with Jesus. But Mary's taken the role of a disciple. She's sitting at the feet of the rabbi to learn what he would teach that day. And women were not supposed to do that in that culture. Wouldn't you be a little upset, like Martha, if you were in, that, in her position? Now, you might not go and ask your guest to correct your sibling. You might go and say, hey, Mary, can you come here for a second? I need your help. Or you might be that angry that <laughs> other things might get said. Um, but the reality, because the reality is here, everyone in that space needed to eat. Somebody had to cook. It's not as if they could call the local falafel joint and have it delivered. <laughs> and then what's up with Jesus taking Mary's side? Lots have been made about Jesus' corrective words to, to Martha, and you can take a couple of different lessons from it. What distracts us from focusing on Jesus? What is keeping you and me from focusing our lives on what Jesus teaches and how we should live it out? We should sit at his feet each and every day. And you could also say, as I told the kids, there's a need and a time to do chores, and there is a need and a time to learn and to contemplate and to pray. The bottom line is that Mary and Martha were good friends of Jesus, and Jesus valued them. His ministry would have been much more difficult without them. I want to use this story more as a jumping-off point to help us to celebrate Women's History Month, which is March, by the way. 
Um, because as Jesus honored and respected and valued women, I want to take a few minutes to honor the women who have impacted and been pioneers in faith, and especially in Methodism. The hymns that we are singing today, the three hymns, one of them is, was commissioned by the United Methodist Women, the first one. The second one, as we just sang, outlines the roles that many of the women in, that Jesus met in his ministry took up. And the third one is written by the most prolific uh, female hymn writer um, probably ever. Fanny Crosby wrote upwards of 8,000, almost 9,000 hymns. That rivals Charles Wesley, who I think wrote a few less. Just saying. So Methodism actually would not be what it is today without the, uh, the work of Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles. She influenced their life by teaching the classics, by teaching the Bible to them. She set aside time each week to be with each one of her, her children and to pay attention just to that one. I don't know what the others did at the time, but I, actually the older ones took care of them is what, what happened. Um, the devotional practices that she taught, they made their way into the Methodist club meeting routines at Oxford University where John and Charles were there when, when they went to study. She was kind of the root, if you will, of a lot of the practices that we take up in, in the Methodist Church. So I want to share with you a select timeline of the history of women in Methodism, warts and all, because we're not, we certainly are not perfect in the United Methodist Church and never have been. But in 1768, Barbara Heck, a woman who is known as the mother of American Methodism, she lives in New York City, she urges Philip Embry to start preaching. And he starts preaching, and, and the, the uh, movement starts to grow in New York City. Barbara helps to design John Street Chapel, uh, which became John Street Church, one of the earliest congregations in the United States, or the colonies at that time. In 1787, over the objection of some of the male preachers, John Wesley authorizes Sarah Mallet to preach. In 1827, Isabel Bomfrey, a slave who changes her name to Sojourner Truth, was emancipated when slavery was abolished in New York. She helps to co-found Kingston Methodist Church, actually a church where several of my friends have served um, years after. But 15 years after uh, her, her emancipation, Sojourner Truth feels the call of the Spirit preach. She begins to travel and becomes involved in the abolitionist movement, and her public speaking engagements combine um, her faith and her experiences as a slave. In 1857, the United Brethren General Conference passes a resolution that no woman should be allowed to preach, period. In 1863, Fanny Crosby, a lifelong Methodist, wrote her first hymn. 9,000 more would follow. Uh, in 1866, Helener Davison was ordained a deacon by the North Indiana Conference of the Methodist Protestant Church, one of our predecessor denominations. She's the first woman ordained in the Methodist tradition. In 1869, Margaret Newton Van Cott is the first woman uh, in the Methodist Episcopal Church to receive a local preacher's license. In 1873, Anna Howard Shaw acquired her local preacher's license from the Methodist Episcopal Church. And Anna Oliver, a couple of years later, becomes the first woman to graduate from an American seminary and receive her Bachelor's of Divinity degree from Boston University. Now, the two Annas, Anna Howard Shaw and Anna Oliver were then refused ordination rights by the Methodist Episcopal General Conference in 1880. In 1888, five women, 
Frances Willard, who is the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, was elected, they were elected delegates to General Conference, but General Conference refused to, refused to seat them, and male delegates took their place. In 1889, Ellen Niswonger was the first woman ordained by the United Brethren Church. And it wasn't until 1920 that the Methodist Episcopal Church granted women the right to be licensed as local preachers, but still not to be ordained. Finally, in, eight, in 1922, 18 women were seated as the first female lay delegates to General Conference. In 1924, the Methodist Episcopal Church granted limited clergy rights to women as local deacons and elders, but they still couldn't have full conference membership. It wasn't until 1956 that the Methodist Episcopal Church gave full clergy rights to women. Actually, it was the Methodist Church by that time. Gave full clergy rights to women in 1956. Maud Keister Jensen was the first woman ordained. In 1967, Margaret Herrickson was the first woman appointed as a district superintendent. And in 1968, the United Methodist Church was formed, finally affirming full clergy rights for all women. A lot of things happened in 1968. <laughs> um, 1976, clergy women delegates were elected for the first time to General Conference. And it wasn't until 1980 that Marjorie Matthews was the first woman who was elected bishop in the United Methodist Church. 1984, Leonton Kelly was the first African-American woman to be elected bishop. And it was in 1996 that First Lady Hillary Clinton, a lifelong Methodist, spoke at General Conference in Denver. And then Bishop Judith Craig was the first woman to deliver the Episcopal Address at General Conference that same year. In 2004, Minerva Carcano was the first Hispanic woman elected bishop. And in 2016, Bishop Latrell Miller Easterling, our bishop, was elected along with six other women. That's the largest class of women bishops ever, ever elected until this year. And I believe it was eight. Yeah. And then in 2019, the United Methodist Women celebrated 150 years of existence. In 2020, the United Methodist Church membership stood at 56% of the membership of the church were women. I think it, it's probably about the same today. But 32% of the full-time clergy are women in the church, as a, in the denomination as a whole. In the Baltimore-Washington Conference, it's 44%. But women earn an average of 11% lower compensation than men. Is anybody surprised by that? Um, some United Methodist churches continue to struggle with women's ordination and won't accept women as pastors. Um, Fairhaven's ahead of the game. I believe you uh, welcomed Reverend Esther with open arms. Um, and Bishop, Bishop Easterling won't put up with it either. <laughs> so that's just a maybe a little bit more history than you wanted to know. But in a world where thousands of divorces of abused women were just voided by the Taliban yesterday, in a world where women's education is curtailed and even eliminated in some areas, in a world where women are persecuted in Iraq and other countries for not wearing hijab, in a world where in the United States, women earn an average of 82% as men do for doing the same job. Obviously, we still got work to do. So as Jesus welcomed and honored and valued women and their contributions to society, we are called to do the same in the United Methodist Church, in our workplaces, in the United States and around the world. We do the work of justice 
when we see persecution and inequality in our midst. One of the nonprofits that is lifting up and supporting women is uh, Sir Optimist. They believe that education is the key to unlocking economic empowerment of the world's women and girls. Their dream program is primarily delivered by local clubs across North America, Latin America, and the Pacific Rim. Tyra Wright is a young woman living in Philadelphia. She was mentally and emotionally abused by her boyfriend. She had to get an order of protection against him. She moved back with her mom. She enrolled in college while she was doing a full-time job as a billing coordinator for a law firm. She still couldn't quite make ends meet, so she applied for the Dream Program Scholarship and one day was surprised to get a phone call that she had won one of those scholarships. It was enough money to pay for her books while she was at school. Since graduating, she has opened her own Sir Optimist Club, and she started a nonprofit women's, the nonprofit Women's Solo Project, which educates and supports women who are in abusive situations. She says, I'm proud to work with women and gain, to help them gain their lives back with independence and self-sufficiency. So who are the women? Who are the women leaders who have touched your lives? Who are the women who continue to impact your life? If I think about my life, I think about my grandmother, my grandmothers, plural, my mother, a um, couple of pastors at my home church that helped me discern my call to ministry. I can name most of the faculty at Wesley Theological Seminary, male and female, but uh, Reverend, uh, Dr. Sharon Ringy, the New Testament professor, and Dr. Lucy Lane Hogan, as my preaching professor, um, really had incredible influences on my ministry in life. I've had two, two female district superintendents, including Reverend Don Hand right now, and Bishop Easterling, and countless colleagues and friends who continue to touch my heart and influence my life. So whether you are a man or a woman, give thanks to God for the strong women who have influenced your faith and your life. And may we continue to work for justice until all people can live with dignity and respect. Thanks be to God, and amen. We come to a time in our service to offer joys and concerns. All right. Um, I'm giving God thanks for heat this morning. <laughs> And thank, thanks to God to, uh, for, for Skip and for Magnum and the work that they did yesterday with our heating contractor to make sure that we had heat today. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your spirit, your presence, your image is imprinted upon each one of us and you love us beyond measure. You love us when we can't love ourselves. You love us when we can't love our enemies. You love us when we can't even love our friends. But gracious God, um, we know there are times in our lives where we are less than lovable too. So help us, help us dear God, to, to uh, repent of sin. Help us to act in ways that are loving. Help us to be forgiving people ourselves. Help us to serve as you call us to serve and to be the people you need us to be in your world. Loving, gracious God, we thank you for this congregation of, of men and women who serve with joy. We thank you for both those who plan and those who who are contemplatives, who study and pray. For, oh God, we need, we need them both. We need, we need all. 
continue to pour your spirit out upon us and help us to be faithful in what we say and do for this world and for this community and for your kingdom. We give you thanks for Ellen and for her many gifts and talents. We thank you that she will be able to retire uh, later this month and that uh, we give you thanks for her achievements of honorary uh, doctorates and we, we celebrate with her. We know they are well-deserved. So gracious God, thank you for blessing her with these gifts and thank you, O oh God, for blessing us with her presence. We ask you to be with those who are in need this day, especially those who are in need of healing. We name before you Jen, who is recovering from surgery and whose uh, wound has opened up again. We ask you to be with Bob as he faces cancer and be with Pat and uh, be, with, be with her to support him. We ask you to be with Margaret and with Jill and be with them as, as, they, face, um, as they face chemotherapy. Gracious God, um, be with all who need your healing in body, mind, or spirit. Be with each one of us, for we know we, that there are things that are going on in our lives that need your healing touch. As we look around our world and we see a world full of violence, we see a world, uh, we, we see a world that basic necessities of life are not offered to all, we see a world where some contribu where contributions of women in particular, but uh, others as well, are not valued and, are, and uh, are regulated. Gracious God, change hearts, change minds. Help us all to see the value and dignity of each human being on the face of the earth, to make sure they have the things that they need uh, in order to live and to thrive and help us to value the contributions of each and every person so that we, we as a human race might grow together and serve each other and serve you. We pray for those who mourn this day, and we ask you to be with, with all who mourn and bring them comfort and bring them peace, and may your presence um, show them the gift of new life. And now, O oh God, as we offer these prayers before you, we lift them up in the name of Jesus Christ, for he is worthy of all the honor and the glory that we can give. And we place our faith, our trust, and our hope in him and in your presence in all the aspects of our lives. These things we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to that time in our service where we offer ourselves before God, we will make our financial offerings for the gifts and ministry of Jesus so that his ministry continues in this time and place. Thank you for all who uh, make your offerings online. Thank you for all who mail them in. Thank you for all who place them in the offering plates this day. Our ushers will receive the morning offering. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the many gifts that are represented here. 
We thank you for the giver, and we thank you, O God, for the abundance that you have provided so that we might give. Bless these offerings that they may use to further the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world today. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you please be seated and prepare your hearts to come to the table of the Lord as we celebrate Holy Communion. God is with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift, lift them up, up to God. God. Let us give thanks to the Holy One, our God. It, it is good and beautiful to give God our praise. Gracious and loving God, thank you for inviting us into your lovely house, to your beautiful table. You provide for us abundantly and welcome us sweetly. You establish justice and care for those who are oppressed. You sit at our feet and listen lovingly to us. You set us at peace with you and give us harmony and belonging. Therefore, with all creation, we sing your praise with one voice. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are all who come in your name. And blessed is Jesus, your Christ, the visible appearance of your invisible presence. He embodied your love and created a home in you for us. Crucified and risen, he reconciled us to you. He blessed our many ways of serving. And he led us to the one necessary thing, your love flowing through us eternally. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the Lord Jesus was sharing a meal with his disciples and friends. During that meal, he took a loaf of bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, remembering these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that we may be for the world the body of Christ. May the fullness of your grace be in us. May we be strong and steadfast in our trust in your promise. Amen. As forgiven, reconciled children of God, let us pray the prayer our Savior taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open communion table. If you are here this day and have heard the words of invitation and intend to lead a new life in Christ, you are welcome to receive the body and blood of our Savior. Um, we, I would invite you at this time, as, as we break bread, 
that you can open the top of your cups and let us break the bread of Christ and share in the bread of life. This is the body of Christ given for you and for me. I would invite you to open the cup for this is the blood of Christ that is given for you. Drink from it that we might drink from the blood of salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. We have offered us, you have offered us the deepest hospitality. Send us now into the world to offer hospitality to all in service and in friendship in the company of Christ. Amen. Amen. Will you please be seated and listen for these discipleship opportunities, opportunities to serve our Savior and Lord. Um, first, contrary to what was in the e-messenger this week, um, I didn't look at my 
calendar carefully. I will not be in the office on Wednesday, so if you're looking for me, send me an email and I'll get back to you when I get free. Um, there's a clergy-wide conference gathering on, uh, or conference-wide clergy gathering on Wednesday. Um, join us for fellowship time. Coffee Hour is being hosted by the Kaisers and Emily Brothers um, just down the hall here in, in Fellowship Hall. Um, we, we will have a, a good time of fellowship and, and, and goodies. Next Sunday is the second of our Let's Chat Diversity Conversations. Please join us after worship and after coffee hour to, uh, to be part of that conversation. And the Gaithersburg Help Food Drive begins next week so that we might feed those in need in and around our midst. And now go forth telling the story of Jesus. Go forth singing the songs of faith. Go forth to serve and to be the people of God in the world. Thanks be to God and amen.